we know that Jesus Christ is the one that reveals the Father. His disciples ask him, show us the Father, and what did Jesus say? He said, see me, and you see the Father. Well, here what we're going to see in these first few verses and throughout chapter 42 is the Father revealing the Son. And how it is that the Father sees what we'll see called here His servant, or in this case, my servant. In verse 1 of chapter 42, it says, Behold, my servant whom I uphold. Whenever we see the word behold, it's not just, hey, check it out. This is something that God is instructing. It is a command. It is behold, do this. I'm telling you to do this. He says, I want you to behold, to see my servant, the servant in whom I uphold. For Israel, this would have been a matter of looking forward to a Messiah that was yet to come. For us, it's a matter of looking back. So the the behold for them was futuristic. Ours is to be able to go back and clearly see Jesus Christ as who it is. Because as we see in this, the my servant is capitalized being God's servant, God's son, none other than clearly identified as Jesus Christ. When he says, behold Jesus, what does it mean? What what is it that we're supposed to see? We know that we see the Son of God. We know that there's God in flesh, the Messiah, the Savior, and so much more. I mean, let's face it, books have been written about just the names, the descriptions, the character of Jesus, and what they all mean. But as we look here, we see God call Jesus my servant. We talked last time about how this idea of being a servant or a slave is kind of a foreign concept to us. We live in the land of the free and the home of the brave, and the last thing we want to do is feel like or believe that in some way or another that we are a servant or a slave to anyone or anything. But the reality is is that we are. I mean, the reality is is that each and every one of us have got something or another that we find ourselves serving, some willingly, some not so much. But when we look at Jesus as a servant, the first thing we do in defining his service is we understand that he is one that absolutely did so of his own free will. He served his master, in this case, his father. But Jesus' servanthood goes more and much further and much much more in depth than that. He's not only a servant, but he's an example of what we are to be as servants. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter twenty. Verses 26 through 28, Jesus said, Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. So not only performing the Master's will and doing so willingly without any force or compulsion you also see that jesus wants us to follow him and his example in exactly the same way but only listen only if we're willing to only if it's by choice god doesn't want and jesus especially for those that would call him lord and refer to themselves as christians never wants us to feel like we are being forced or compelled into service as a matter of fact While you can force somebody into service, while you can compel them by threat or by danger or by harm, the reality is is that no one will ever willingly serve a master unless they love them. Unless there's the ability to be able to do so completely free of our own will, we'll never translate that. Now, it may be some kind of weird psychotic state that we get into where we think we like what we're doing when we're abused, and that's a whole other subject. But the reality is is that in order to be able to willingly serve, there has to be this element that translates into love. And Jesus is not only our past example, but he continues to serve us every day through his love, through his guidance, his continual intercession. Jesus was, is, and will continue to be the servant of God. And we benefit from his serving. In this service, he bridges the, back, the gap between us and God in such a way that we have not only a clear path, but I would even venture to say an easy path to a loving God. He calls him my elect one in whom my soul delights. Now, this is a very interesting way to 
describe Jesus and saying that he is my elect once, God now talking specifically about how Jesus Christ is literally the only one in which his soul can delight. Now this is important. A lot of folks get hung up or wonder why we as Christians are so hung up on Jesus Christ. How come we put Jesus in, in, in the first place of everything that has to do with our faith? And it's because he is the elect of God. He is the one in whom God delights. As the Son of God, Jesus is the ultimate, listen, the ultimate, as in the only one, elect of God. He's the only one in whom God can take pleasure and receive without His intervention. Stay with me. Jesus is the only one who lived as a man, sinless, perfect, and therefore is acceptable and can be received by God without the covering of for that sin. And because our salvation comes through Jesus, it means that he is the only one who is able to bring us into that right relationship as being additional elected of God, but only because we stand covered in his righteousness. That makes him more than important. It makes him more than a great teacher. It makes him more than a great philosopher. It makes him more even than, than just what so many try to make him out to be as a prophet or someone who was, was filled with God's Spirit and did good works. It means that Jesus Christ is the only reason that mankind can have hope. He's our only, only source to God. It says, I've put my Spirit upon him. Jesus relied on the power, the same power, the same spirit that he has also imparted to us. And while we shouldn't have any misconceptions about who we are and the power that we possess, we should have absolutely no means by which we would excuse or think that there would not be ample power in the spirit of God to do within us all that he did in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ even said, you're going to do bigger and greater things than I did. Wow, come on. Pastor, get serious. He was, he was Jesus. Same spirit. Same spirit. Same God that raised Jesus from the dead is the same spirit that dwells and empowers us to do that which he has called us to do. And the spirit of God is always purposed to do one thing and manifest in our lives in, in, in hundreds of different ways. The whole purpose of the spirit is to provide us with the power to testify that Jesus Christ is the Savior. You see, that's the purpose of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, he serves a lot of different means by which he accomplishes that. He becomes our, our teacher, and he becomes our tutor, and he becomes the one that walks with us, and he was the one that, that comes upon us, and he's the one that does all of these wonderful interaction aspects of our spirit communing with his. But the reality is, is that that same power that was in Jesus to do everything that Jesus did is the same power that we have access to. The same power. He says, I will bring forth, or he will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. We talked about this last week briefly. Whereas salvation came first to the Jew, it's not withheld from the Gentile. And I think it's amazing that hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus Christ was even born, in the foundations of the world, when God decided how it was that he was going to have mankind and the means by which we would be reconciled, included us. Did you know that before God even created the world from the foundation of time, it says, that he knew us. He knew we would be sitting here tonight. He knew that we would be drawing into and learning from his word and learning for the things that he... And it says that, that all of these things... And this is a time when Isaiah is writing that the Gentiles were not real popular. Are you with me? Okay? The Jews were all about the God thing, and God was was for the Jews, and the Jews were God's people, and man, it wasn't about the Gentiles. And here Isaiah says, hey, look at this. Justice for the Gentiles, an opportunity. He'll not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Doesn't mean that Jesus' voice wasn't heard. It wasn't obscured. It wasn't hidden. The message of salvation, that which took place, this isn't something that happened and we had to go looking for it. It was right out front. This was, was right there. It's the most written about event in relationship to all of human history, that which the, the, the 
aspect of what Christ touched in his life, in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection has been recorded and referred to more than any other thing ever in the world. Not obscured, not hidden. But the thing that I love about the fact that Jesus is who he says he is, is that if you have all authority, if you have all power, if you are the creator God, you don't have to argue with your creation. You with me? I mean, how silly would it be if God felt the need or if Jesus felt the need to have to argue his existence with us? Now, we argue about it with him all the time. Do you realize that there's nowhere in Scripture that God ever defends himself as being God? In the first verse of the Bible, in the beginning, God created. It doesn't doesn't explain who he is, where he came from. I love all these TV shows. Where did God come from? The origins of God. It's like, shut up. You have no clue where God came from because God has always been. God doesn't defend himself, and we don't need to think that somehow or another that we have to come to this place of rushing in and trying to defend God. God's word, God himself is able to withstand any challenge from any man. And you know how he stands to, up to it? He doesn't like squish us like a bug. He doesn't like, like throw lightning bolts at us. He loves us. The way that he stands up to the ridicule, the way that he stood up to the ridicule that came against his son was he allowed his son to be the sacrifice for your and my sin. The perfect example of power is not in how much force is exerted against another object it's how much love is demonstrated to that which is even pushing back the other direction and that's why jesus needed not to raise his voice or to boast or to brag and you remember that those were exactly the things that satan tried to challenge him with in the wilderness when he tried to get him to show off jump off the temple top Jump off the edge of the temple, and it says that the angels won't let you hit the ground and get hurt, so you jump off. Everybody will see you. See, that was the whole thing. It was to try to get him to do something that was prideful, to get him something that would draw notoriety. If everybody saw what he was doing, they would have to believe, now wouldn't they? Perfect power is not exercised by force, but by love. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench. A reference to Christ's gentleness, that by having all power, he doesn't need to exercise it because he contains it. Instead, God takes his power, he translates it into love, and he rests, allows us to rest in his hand in such a way that no matter how broken we are, how bruised we are, how, how fragile we are, that he won't break us. He's not going to be the last straw that breaks the camel's back. He's not going to take and, and force us into some sort of compliance by virtue of breaking us unjustly. Now, you realize that there are times when God allows us to be broken. Sometimes I think he actually helps us in that manner. But it's not broken in the sense of breaking us to our destruction. It's broken in the sense that our hearts would turn and come back to Him based on the love that He is exercising towards us. It says He'll bring forth justice and truth. And I love this back and forth. On one hand, Isaiah says, a bruised reed He won't break, but at the same time, understand, He's, he's not a lightweight. Don't mistake His gentleness for some form of weakness. His justice is perfect, and His justice and His righteousness will never come into question. No one will ever be able to stand before the Lord and rightly accuse Him of unfairness. Oh, there's going to be a lot that are going to try. You know, there's going to be a lot of people on the Day of Judgment that are going to go, Hey, this isn't fair. I thought I was doing right because I listened to this Yahoo or that Yahoo. And, and, and I think that really what's going to come down to it is God's just going to go, why didn't you just read my word? Why didn't you just listen to me? Oh, but you see, you got to understand, this guy had all the answers. Obviously not, because he just went before you and he didn't make it either. There's going to be this aspect of us coming to this place and understanding that there is a justice of God that will always be fair. And I like that. 
if I'm going to serve the most powerful entity in the world, if I am going to serve the creator God of the universe, I want to know that he will always be fair with me. Isn't that cool? You know, there's other religions out there that have a problem with this whole fairness factor, right? There's other religions out there that no matter what you do, you don't ever know until the end result, right? Islam is like that. Islam, unless you martyred and are martyred in jihad, unless you take lives in, in, in a holy war against Jews or Christians, you're not guaranteed heaven. It's just a possibility. I'll let you know when you get there. And you may show up and he may just go, psych, and, it's, and you don't get in. I think that's pretty rude. I think that that's not the kind of God that I want to follow in relationship to understanding that I can trust his word because his word doesn't fail and that he's just and he's right. The other thing that that does in the settling of my heart is all of those questions that people have. Well, what about those people and these people and what about these situations where where people may not have ever been introduced to jesus christ all i say is i say hey god is just he's fair he's not going to be unfair in judging those but he will be totally fair in judging us who have heard he will not be nor or not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastland shall wait for his law. Discouragement is a big deal. It can be very dis- devastating in people's lives, and depression and despair are very real and constant threats to many. Many struggle with feels of, feelings of hopelessness because of injustice or because of evil that they see in the world or in their lives. And yet we have this promise. Jesus will not fail, nor will he be discouraged by what's going on in the world. Now listen to this. This is so cool. Jesus doesn't see the world based on how it is. Jesus sees the world based on how it will be. He knows what it's going to look like under his rule, just like he sees us. Aren't you glad that Jesus saw the potential in you and me? Aren't you glad that when he looked at us, he didn't look at us as maybe the world did or as maybe our friends or our loved ones or our parents did, right? I mean, I was dubbed most likely to go to prison in the yearbooks. I was, I had somebody say, yeah, he's the most, I did go to prison for like 14 years. They just didn't see the twist where that I would work there. <laughs> But all that time, God saw potential. And so he doesn't get discouraged. See, we get discouraged. God doesn't look at you. And sometimes you think so. Sometimes you think that, man, God must be like just really (laughs) disappointed in me. He must be really discouraged. He must be really, really at the point of just throwing up his hand and saying, I don't know what I'm going to do with Gary. What in the world am I going to do with Chet? What am I going to do with Ben? What am I going to do? He doesn't get discouraged. Jesus doesn't get discouraged based on what's happening in the world because he is the one that has the authority and the power to make all right. And so anything that happens, happens because he allows it to. Amen? Thus says God, the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people, on it and the spirit to those who walk on it you see there's a reason that we really need to understand that god has a different perspective because we need to consider the source of who is speaking to us right now how many of you have ever heard the expression when somebody's telling you something consider the source and normally it's in relationship to a source that we discount isn't it i mean normally say well you know This is what I heard about so-and-so, but consider the source. And it's almost a derogatory type of thing. Well, here, God is saying here, I I, want to give you these promises. I want to tell you everything that's going to take place. I want to tell you how I'm going to care for for this servant of mine and the way that he's going to be made manifest. And here's my credentials. Here's who it is that's talking to you. Here's the source, and you can check this source. He says, because... I am the one who created the heavens 
and all that's in it. I am the one who formed the earth and all that you see. When you look at yourself in the mirror, the very breath that you have, I have given you. And because I am God, my promise is true concerning my servant, Jesus Christ. I love that. God throwing down his credentials as only God can do. I want you to know that my word is trustworthy because I'm the one that created. How many times have we come across something in our lives or a promise that we know that God has given us and we start to fail or we start to doubt or we start to, to pull away from that which we, we really know is true, but we're having difficulty living that truth? I think all we've got to do is we've just got to remember who gave us the promise. Oh, I know, I've been promised a lot of stuff by a lot of people. And depending on who I'm promised by, I either, well, take it to the bank or wait for the check to clear. But we don't have to do that with God. God says, I'm the one that gave you breath. You don't need to worry about any of this taking place. But then something happens very neat here. God now turns his attention to Jesus. And he turns his attention to him with a promise for the calling that he's placed on his life and and it's interesting because he he starts out he says i the lord have called you being his servant being jesus to righteousness but why would god give encouragement to his son i mean we know that god is a triune God, that He's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know that if you see the Son, you see the Father. We know that one is in the other, and the other is in the other one. It's, it's, it's all, all the same, same, same to some degree, with the exception of the fact that we know Jesus came to earth as a human being. And in His humanity, there are promises that He needs to have in relationship to what has taken place and what will take place while He's in that position of the, the servant of God. The humanity of Jesus, listen, the humanity of Jesus is absolutely equ as equally as important as the deity of Jesus. Now what that means is the fact that Jesus was all man, was born into the, 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 the human race, and yet at the same time was still all God, are equally important in relationship to the purposes that they serve. We're never going to get that. Okay, I mean, our finite minds are never going to be able to wrap around the fact that it could be all man and all God all at the same time. We can't. We want it to be one or the other completely, but the reality of, of, of being one and the other all at the same time doesn't work in our minds. But we have to understand that Jesus came as a man purposed in Galatians 4, verse 4 and 5, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And listen again. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law. Jesus had to be born in, in flesh in order to be under the law, in order to become the suitable sacrifice for those who were under the law. Do you guys realize, and, and this is, this is a, a, a modern problem for a lot of people in the church, because we're not under the law, are we? We're under what? Grace. Does the law still apply to us? Oh. Which law is that? Is that that law of sin and death? <laughs> is, it, is, that that, is that that law that says that the wages of sin are death, right? And that everyone that is born into this world is born into a, to, to the position of death under the law, are we not? Oh, now the grace comes in through our acceptance of Jesus Christ, and we have been made to where we are no longer responsible and accountable to that law, but the law still works, doesn't it? So in order for there to be a suitable sacrifice, Jesus had to be all flesh. He had to be the only one that could walk as a perfect man to become the perfect sacrifice, to be sacrificed for the sins that you and I have brought upon him. So it was necessary. It was absolutely a requirement of salvation. Another reason for Christ's humanity 
is that it allows us to be able to relate to him and him to be able to relate to us. We're told that we don't have a high priest that isn't familiar with all of our afflictions, all of our trials, all of the things that we go through. Jesus suffered every type of, of, of trial and temptation that we're faced with, yet did not what? Sin. Wow. How did he do that? Well, he was God. No, he did that because of the power of the Spirit that was within him and his will to serve and to stay with the will of the Father. You see, that's the same thing that he's given to us. Do you guys realize that we don't have to sin? We just do it because we don't think we can't? We sometimes sin because we think it's fun. Oh, this will be fun, and it didn't, doesn't turn out that way. But we don't have to sin. We've been given the power and the authority to be able to overcome those things in our lives by the same power and the same Spirit that allowed Christ to walk in perfection. But he was challenged in his humanity. He was subject to every trial. He was subject to physical suffering, emotional suffering, spiritual pain. He suffered and he died so that we can, by his example, relate to him personally. And finally, Jesus had to come in the flesh and he had to die in the flesh because believing that Jesus died and rose again is a prerequisite for our salvation. So for those of you who will tell you, well, you know, Jesus was just spirit. Jesus really didn't die. He just, you know, how many of you have ever heard of the swoon theory? Right? Jesus didn't really die. He just, he just like, like got so physically exhausted by being crucified that he passed out. And then he woke up three days later and rolled that big stone out of the way and he, he released himself, right? Right. Yeah, after taking a spear in the side that punctured and ruptured his heart. No, you see, Jesus was all man. Suffered the same types of issues that we suffer with, the same types of thoughts, the same types of pain, emotional, spiritual, physical, that we did. Because Jesus came in the flesh, we now can see how important confronting or how comforting these words from the Father would have been to the Son. Think about it for a minute. And we're going to start looking at this in great detail on Sunday mornings as we start approaching Easter. And we start looking at the tail end of Matthew. We're going to start looking at some of the things that Jesus went through in, in, in His humanity that these words from the Father would have been great inspiration and great assistance to Him. Look at what God says. He says, first He says, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. He says, I've called you in righteousness. Now, he's not talking about us. He's talking about his son. He's talking about his servant. He's talking about Jesus. The calling of God on the work of his son was perfectly righteous. But then the Father says, and I'm going to hold your hand. <laughs> I'm going to stay with you. I'm going to be right with you. The only time that there was a separation between God the Father and God the Son was when Jesus Christ took on your sin and my sin. And God the Father had no choice but to look away, not to continue fellowship. And it was the only time that Jesus found himself separated from the Father. And we'll see that in more detail, too, because we find that that's the basis, I believe, for the prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. He says, I will keep you. I love this idea of being kept. Have you ever kept anything? Maybe, have you got the, anybody in here got stuff that you've kept for a very, very long time? It's a, we call them keepsakes, right? And you, you put it in some place really, really special so you'll never forget where it is, and then what do you do? You forget where it is. So we design special places to keep special things because we want them to be kept. To be kept means that it can never be lost. I love this aspect of understanding that not only are these attributes and there are these promises that God is making to his servant, but these are also promises that have been passed on to us that as we are kept by Christ, as we are kept by God, we can never be lost. We can never be out of his sight. 
It says, I give you as a covenant to the people. Jesus was given to all people. All whosoever will can partake in the new covenant that Jesus Christ has established by his sacrifice. He'll open blind eyes and bring out prisoners. God would provide to Christ all of the power by his spirit to do all of the supernatural works and restoration that needed to happen in order to bring man to salvation. And again, what the most important and amazing part of this is that these same promises that were given to Jesus are given through Jesus who prayed for us. And he prayed this way in John chapter, uh, I don't know what chapter. I have a verse. In John, look it up. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you, this is Jesus talking to the Father, sent me into the world, I have also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I have sanctify, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by truth. As God sent the Son, Jesus sends us. Same power. Same, same. I like that. It, it was 17. Is it 18? Uh, uh, 17, 17 through 19, right? I confused myself because I just had 17 19, and I thought those, were, and, and it was the verses, but I didn't thank you. I was closer than I thought. We are the people of his covenant, and we receive redemption by the blood, and it's the same power from the same Holy Spirit that gives us the power over the physical, our flesh, and the spiritual, the enemy. Verse 8 says, I am the Lord. That is my name, and my glory will I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and the new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you, or tell them, I tell you them. Once again, God adds his credentials. This is what's going to happen. This is how it's going to be. I'm going to hold you up. Now, God went through and, and, and revealed and said, this is the the things that the, the son is going to do, that the servant is going to do, and you can trust what I'm telling you because I'm God. Now he says to, to Jesus, I'm putting you in the same boat. These are the things that I'm going to do for you. And again, here's my credential. I'm the Lord. God says these promises are mine and they're mine alone. No one can, can fulfill them, nor can anyone share in the glory of the Lord. Guys, there's only one God. There's only one God. And no one else can make these claims. It's interesting because there's so many folks that follow other gods or other processes or other belief systems that can't make the claims that God can make. Don't even try. Don't even attempt to. And the thing that's so amazing is that they will do this as if somehow or another that they can put their faith, as the Scripture tells us, in a in an idol that has a mouth but can't speak and has eyes but can't see and has hands but can't touch, right? That is just basically a chunk of wood in relationship to all other gods. They have no means by which they can take and fulfill any of their promises. And God says that I can do this and I can prove by virtue of the fact that I'm going to tell you these things before they happen. We call that what? Prophecy. Do you realize that there's no other religious system that has prophecy? I mean, do, you, do you realize that? Why is that? Why is it that Buddha didn't prophesy? Because he didn't know. Confucius. Confucius was just confused. He couldn't prophesy. There's no other religious approach or religious venture, if you will, that, that is able to say this is what's going to happen and have time bear out that that is exactly what happened. And yet people run around all the time saying, well, this religion and that, all religions are the same. No, they're not. They lack prophecy. They lack a God that knows the past, the present, and the future all at the same time. One of the other means by which we can trust the Lord is because the end is already determined. Look at what it says in verse 10. 
Sing to the Lord a new song and His praise from the end of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it, you coastlands and inhabitants of them, like the wilderness and the cities, lift up your voice. The villages of Kedar inhabit. Let the inhabitants of Salah sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to the Lord and declare His praise in the coastland. Many places in Scripture we're told that we're supposed to sing a new song. To sing a new song. What is a new song? I mean, what, what is that? I mean, you know, we do new songs here occasionally. We might actually get the chance to listen to a new song tonight. Yeah, we're going to do a new song. This is not what it's talking about. <laughs> you see, the idea of this new song is an understanding, is a reflection of the fact, fact that God's mercies, His glory, His revelation, what God does in our life is new every morning, yet every minute, isn't it? It's new. God's stuff isn't the old stuff. It isn't, it isn't something that happened once and hasn't happened since. It isn't something that's only going to happen one time and maybe never again. Wow, wasn't that great? Salvation was good. I got saved back in 1989, and I haven't moved off that mark since. Wow, what a bummer. God's mercies are new every day. And the idea here is that we would take and translate that into being able to recognize and be able to have, have, have this sense of being being in this place of praise and worship for God, for that which He does moment by moment in our lives. You see, that's a new song. When we see places in, in, in Scripture where, where we know that there were times when, when Israel would cross over a, a, a body of water, they'd build a monument, and we know that when they came through the Red Sea that there was a new song. There was a song that they broke out, and they talked about all the things that happened. They were accounting for what God did right there in their lives. And it was a new song. You got a new song? I mean, have you got some things that God's doing in your life right now and is, is, is moving to you a place that you can take and you can praise Him and you can worship Him in, in the newness that He is providing in your life based on your willingness to give Him thanks and praise for that work? The Lord shall go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up His zeal like a man of war. He shall cry out, yes, shout aloud. He shall prevail against these enemies. I have held my peace a long time. I have been still and restrained myself. Now I will cry like a woman in labor. I will pant and gasp at once. I will lay waste the mountains and the hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will make the rivers coastlands, and I will dry up the pools. The work of the servant of God is not passive, but is coming with great zeal. When Jesus first came, he was restrained by love. I mean, he was. He was restrained by love. He didn't come as a judge. He came as one who sought after those that were lost. And he did so by sacrificing himself. But there's going to come a time when it says that he's going to come back and his authority is going to be such that nothing will stand between that righteousness and his judgment. I will bring the blind by the way they did not know, and I will lead them in paths that they did not know. I will make darkness light before them, the crooked straight or, and crooked places straight. These things I will do for them and not forsake them. They shall be turned back, and they shall be greatly ashamed, who trust in carved images, who say to molded images, You are our gods. Hear, you deaf, and look, you blind, that you may see. Who is blind but my servant, or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as he who is perfect, or blind as the Lord's servant, seeing many things, but you do not observe, opening the ears, but he does not hear? The Lord just spoke in the previous section about what was going to happen in the leading of those in judgment, but now he turns and he, and he speaks specifically to a warning to his own people. God is speaking to His children who think that they're listening, but they're really not. And we just talked about this, didn't we? You're here on Sunday? Many think they're in, but they're really not? God is saying, guys, there's a, there's a problem here. You're, you're saying that you're seeing me, but you're really not even looking in my direction. You say that you're listening to me, but you're really not because you're not hearing the things that I say. Now, this is one of those things that I think is harder on guys than it is on gals. Women have a tendency to listen better than men. Have you ever noticed that? You guys just went, huh? Yeah. I got, bu I got busted really bad just, just yesterday. 
right? Because because my wife was talking to me about something, and I was I was on the first part of it, right? And it just of all things, I got interrupted by a text. Oh, I hate that. And all of a sudden, she's saying something that I recognize makes absolutely no sense. She just strung a completely, totally unrelated sentence that had no frame of reference, nothing to do with what we were talking about. And the, the only redeeming thing I had going for me is I caught the fact that I missed it. Because right in the middle, I, went, I wasn't listening. She goes, really? I said, yeah, because the last thing you just said doesn't make any sense at all about what you were talking about a minute ago. She says, it didn't make any sense of what I was talking about five minutes ago. That wasn't quite that long. God said, there's a problem when you say you're listening and you're not. But there's something that we need to pay attention to. I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but over the years I have noticed that as I am, I am seasoning, that my eyesight isn't as good as it used to be. And all I got some stuff fixed a while back. I had, you know, had the, the, the LASIK stuff, what, almost 20 years ago now, it feels like. It's been a long time, 15, 20 years, right? I still need these things to see that which I can't hold out far enough to read. My ar- yeah, my arms are shrinking in the process, right? And so I've got to have these in order to be able to see. I've noticed that in order to hear the television, I have to turn it up to the level that annoys my wife. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, those are coming. You know, all these years of music and headphones and all that stuff, I mean, eventually it's, you know, I can't hear out of my left and I'm half deaf in my right. So I'm at that point to where it's like I'm about ready for a miracle here or something, you know. But I've noticed that as I've gotten older that those things are happening. Now, it's really, really good that you would admit that because if you admit it, then you search for and you find and seek help for that, right? I've known an awful lot of people that refuse to admit that they've got a problem with their hearing. And so what you hear from them all the time is, huh? 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 Now, God bless him, he's gone home to be with, 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 with the Lord, but Steph's dad was like that, and it was great. And what was funny was is that he had really, really good hearing aids. He just didn't like to put them in. And he just wouldn't put them in. He didn't like the idea that you had to adjust them and actually dial them in. And if anything, you had to put a battery in it, forget it. I think he wore them one time, the batteries went dead, and he never put them in again. And so we just got used to getting up really, really close and talking really, really loud. And then he would still go, huh? And then we knew it was selective. If we'll be honest with the Lord... This condition of not hearing and not seeing, He'll help us to overcome. But we have to be honest with Him. There's got to be times when we go to the Lord and we say, Lord, I'm sorry, I I wasn't listening. Lord, I wasn't looking for You in that. I wasn't looking for for in in Your direction in order to be able to guide my life. And so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for that. Lord, I need You to provide me with Your hearing aid, with Your vision in my life. And we need to be honest enough. And what the Lord is talking about here is he's he's talking about Israel and he's like you guys are running on autopilot you guys are just out there running you're not really you're saying you're hearing me but you're not hearing me you're saying that you're seeing me but you're not seeing me and how much could that potentially apply to us in our lives as we're moving through this process of life listen look for and if you don't hear him as clear as you want to maybe it's because You're not listening as well as you should be. The Lord is well pleased for His righteousness' sake, and He will exalt the law and make it honorable. But this is a people robbed and plundered. All of them are snared in holes, and they are hidden in prison houses. For they are prey, and no one delivers them for plunder, and no one says, Restore. Who among you will give ear to this? Who will listen and hear for the time to come? Who gave Jacob for plunder and Israel to robbers? Was it not the Lord, he against whom we have sinned? For they would not walk in his ways, nor were they obedient to his law. Therefore he has poured out on him 
the fury of his anger and the strength of battle and has set him on fire all around. Yet he did not know and it burned him and yet he did not take it to heart. Isaiah speaking of the hardship that has come against Israel because they refuse to heed, because they refuse to hear, because they refuse to look. And yes, while we live under grace, we know we cannot meet God's standard, but this doesn't excuse us from listening and looking. It says, For who gave Jacob for plunder and Israel to robbers? Who was it? Was it not the Lord? He against whom we have sinned. Isaiah states the obvious, and it's a daunting truth. He says, who allowed Israel to have all these problems? Let me ask you a question. Who allows us to have all of our problems? Who allows us as individuals, as families, as a church, as a city, as a county, as a state, as a nation, to have problems. Who is it that allows those things to happen if not the Lord? But why? I mean, how, how many times do we, do we say, Lord, why aren't you fixing this? Why aren't you doing something about this? Why aren't, you, why aren't you just taking care of this situation or that situation? Lord, what's wrong with you? And I think that he's just looking at us and going, gee, I don't know. Can you hear me now? You're not listening. You're not looking for me. You're asking me for for me to do something in and amidst of people who are refusing to acknowledge me, refusing to turn to me, refusing to even even recognize that there is a God, let alone a God that is, is, is willing and able and capable of solving that which you find yourself in, but is not willing to do so in the process of your disobedience. And guys, we can make great and huge application to this as it pertains to the nation and, 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 and the larger scale, okay? We can make great application to this when it comes to the state in which we live and we see all of the turmoil and all the problems that are going on and all of the, the political fixes because you see, that's man's way of trying to fix the, the, the sin issue that they have and the, the, the rejection and disobedience to a God that would, would resolve those issues, they try to legislate their way around it. We can't fix all those problems. We get to do our part, and that's really all we get to do. But then it comes down to us. Who is it that allows for the calamity, for the problems for the downturns in our lives, if not for God. He allows it. Now, there's those that want to say, well, God is messing with me. Have you ever felt like God was messing with you? Why why, why did you feel that way? What was the catalyst for God messing with you? Was it because you were being completely obedient and you were seeking His will and you were listening to everything He said and so God was just messing with you? What what normally is the catalyst for, for God messing with you? Yeah. Stop talking. I'm doing this on my own. I'm not listening. God says, okay. You don't want to listen? We'll see what happens. And so the admonition is that we would stay close, that we would stay. We're going to wrap it up there tonight. I had a little more, but we're going to wrap it up. So normally we only got through 42. We'll hold off 43 for the next time. So here's what I want you to think about. God wants to speak. But we'll only hear Him if we're listening. It's okay to tell Him that we're rotten listeners. But be careful, because when we do that, sometimes He'll say, "Then okay, I'm going to going to speak to you in your, in, 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 into a way, to, to you in a way that gets your attention. See, there's been times when God's had to do that with me in my life. There were times when I didn't listen like I should, and I told him that I would pay attention, and I didn't, so he did something very, very incredible in order to be able to get my attention. <laughs> that, that, that's something I try to avoid going forward. 
Are we looking in His direction so that we would see what it is that He has for us? And as we do that, then all of the promises that we see that were given to us tonight, all of the promises that He has given by virtue of His servant, our Savior, Jesus Christ, are ours to hold on to. All of the power, all of the privilege, all of the point of position that we have with God is secured through His servant, Jesus Christ. Amen?